Hey guys, today I'm going to go through some hot topics that might come up in your dental interviews, including a little bit on Brexit. So if you're interested in that, make sure you stick around for the rest of the video. And just a bit about me, I'm Faris, I'm a third year dental student here in the UK. And just before I get into the video, I'd really appreciate it if you guys could like, comment, subscribe and hit that notification down below. Hitting the notification bell and subscribing really helped this channel out because it shows YouTube that you like my content and helps a small creator like me get out there. So I'd really appreciate it if you guys could do that. So enough of that, let's get straight into the hot topics because I know you guys are here for that. So the first hot topic I want to go through is the sugar tax. Now the sugar tax was a tax that was implemented in 2018 as a way to reduce the amount of sugar in drinks, specifically targeting fizzy drinks because they naturally have higher sugar content than other drinks. So the way the tax works is the total sugar content over five grams per 100 ml of drink causes the company to be taxed. As a result of this, you may have realized that whenever you go to Nando's, if you go for the full sugar, you know, regular Coke, you might be charged a little bit more. And this is because of the sugar tax because there's quite a lot of sugar in coca-cola and in these fizzy drinks and the government's trying to reduce these in order to reduce not just dental problems but also some common medical problems some of these include obesity and type 2 diabetes and relating this back to dentistry the reason why the reduction of sugar is very good is because sugar is actually associated with a lot of dental disease the most common of which is caries and this is because sugars are actually used as an energy source for some of the bacteria in your mouth and this causes the breakdown of your enamel and dentine which can cause you to develop something called caries which if left unchecked can actually develop into a cavity and you know no one wants cavities so in an interview, some of the things that you might be asked to do is to just outline the sugar tax. And most likely an important thing would be to evaluate it. So some of the pros of this is that it has cause for the amount of sugar in people's diets to reduce, reducing the likelihood of obesity and type two diabetes and any oral health issues. On top of this, the money generated from the sugar tax, which is roughly 520 million pounds per year, can actually be reinvested into different education schemes to teach about oral health, to teach about exercising and being healthy. And with evaluation, you also want to talk about the negatives. So you can talk about increasing the cost of goods, the fact that people should have the autonomy over what things they want to eat and drink, and whether or not this tax is actually effective at all or if it actually deters people from buying sugary drinks. And just as a little interjection there, I just thought I'd mention that for any hot topic that you're given, most of the time what the interview is looking for is a bit of knowledge of the topic and then usually an evaluation of some sort. The next hot topic I'd like to talk about is preventative dentistry. So this introduces this idea of preventative care, which basically means that dentistry is trying to prevent disease before it progresses and gets to a place where we actually have to have, you know, very intrusive intervention. This is because back in the old days, we used to have something called like this drill and fill culture where patients would only come in if they had like really, really bad and broken down teeth and you know the dentist would just drill out all the bad stuff and fill it with with a filling so nowadays we're trying to shift towards preventative care which means that we're putting more responsibility on the patient trying to teach patients and educate them of the risks of their lifestyle choices and explain to them the interactions that happen in their mouth so some examples of providing preventative care are things like recommending brushing two times a day using fluoride toothpaste flossing and just interdental cleaning in general these are all different ways that we can introduce preventative measures to reduce the likelihood of oral problems from manifesting in the first as well on top of this another preventative method is things like diet modification. Now this means that you can design a specific diet for a patient to ensure that they reduce their sugar intake and thus have a healthier diet and reduce the possibility of caries. And you can actually link this to the sugar tax because as I mentioned before, the sugar tax is meant to reduce the amount of sugar in people's diets. Leading on from this, you can actually relate this idea of preventive measures to the NHS contracts. Now I'm just going to be honest, I think that the NHS contracts are a bit confusing and a lot of students really struggle to explain them properly in the interview. So I'd avoid trying to deeply understand the NHS contracts and instead understand the values that they're trying to promote, of which one is preventative measures and preventative dentistry. Additionally, there's a potential change in the pricing regimen when it comes to NHS dentistry. At the moment, there's a banding system where you have bands one, two, and three, whereby different treatments are ranked in the different bands. And for each band, there's a certain price. I have the prices listed here. And within the current NHS contract, there are these things called UDAs. These are units of dental activity. And this is kind of a system to measure the amount of work done in the dental setting and its complexity. Be aware that there might actually be a shift in this pricing system as time goes on with these potential new NHS contracts. For all the hot topics I mentioned today, I'll be placing links and documents down in the description below so make sure you check that out and then the next big topic that i'm sure you guys want to know about is brexit now i just want to preface this by saying i personally don't think that there's going to be that many questions about brexit and dentistry when it comes to your interviews this is because there's not that much relevant information when it comes to the effects of brexit on dentistry as a whole instead i think they might ask you a question that's less content bound with regards to brexit but more seeing your opinions and your thoughts about how brexit may affect dentistry in the future but regardless i'll go through some main points so you guys have some clarity on how brexit may affect dentistry so one of the main things i think brexit has affected in dentistry is with regards to employment so about six 16 to 17 percent of the workforce in dentistry comes from the eu or the eea which is the european economic area this basically means that a proportion of the workforce actually has trained in the eu and because of the new brexit rules dental care professionals that are not already registered with the gdc have to go through a brand new application system in order for them to train and work in the uk so this is something that's going to directly impact dentistry in that there's going to be a smaller pool of dental care professionals to work in the uk and thus this can cause some employment issues in some private and nhs practices next thing you should be aware of is the effects of brexit on research so as a result of brexit and the uk's departure from the eu research opportunities 
countries have become a bit more complicated. For Brexit, communication between UK and EU universities was a lot easier. One light at the end of the tunnel is that there have been some new initiatives to help promote research between the UK and EU universities. One of these initiatives is called the Horizon Europe Initiative, and this is meant to help with the research and development links between the UK and the EU. Now, this research initiative isn't exclusive to dentistry. However, research in dentistry as a whole is a very important factor and something that is important to be stressed at different universities. And collaboration between UK and EU universities is something that should not be missed. And the last thing I think you guys should be aware of is the MHRA. This is the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority. It has now become the only UK regulator of medicines and medical devices. This means that new dental materials and dental machines that are discovered in the future may need to gain recertification to be used in the UK. This is assuming that they've been produced in the European Union. At the current moment, this isn't a massive issue, but this could be a problem down the line as a result of the new regulations that have been set in place by the UK as a result of Brexit. Mainly because of the fact that 85% of the dental materials used in the UK are actually imported from other countries. Of these, most of them are in the EU. And if you're particularly keen, there's a few extra points you might want to look into, such as impacts on the economy and data protection in dental settings. But very quickly, I just want to reiterate, I personally don't think this is a topic that will be tested that much in your interviews. However, Brexit is a hot topic that a lot of you wanted covered. So I decided I'd make a little bit of information about this so you guys you know, had a bit of a basis if you potentially did get asked a question on Brexit. And then the next hot topic I think you guys should really be aware of is COVID-19. Now, I know you guys probably want to leave COVID-19 back in 2020, but unfortunately, it still is a big topic. Some of the main things I think you should be aware of are things like PPE, which is personal protective equipment. This includes the utilization of masks, such as FFP3 masks. The next thing that I think you should be aware of are AGPs. These are aerosol generating procedures, and these are basically procedures that can cause COVID-19 droplets to spread further in the dental practice due to the nature of AGPs. As a result of this, AGPs are being reduced at the moment in dental practice, and specific measures have been introduced to ensure the infection rate is low. One of these measures is fallow times, so between each AGP, GP, there's a specific amount of time that's given for the room to be well ventilated and effective infection control to take place and thus this has caused some disruption to the workflow of a dental practice. Next thing I say is you should know the effects that it's had on patients and dentists and maybe even dental students and the last few things I'd say is you should know about the sciencey parts of COVID so know the fact that it's a virus, know its transmission, know the symptoms of COVID, have some basic understanding of the vaccine and the potential vaccines that are out there, even reading into some research which goes into more depth about the symptoms and the effects of COVID and last of all I'd say make sure that you evaluate this so make sure you talk about the positives of COVID and the negatives. And I know you might not think there's many positives, and I know that you might be thinking there's so much information there to be had about COVID-19. And if you guys are feeling a little bit confused, make sure you check out my video about COVID-19. It's a full video going all the different things you need to know, and it even has a model answer in the end talking about how you can answer a question about COVID. If you want to watch that, make sure you check out the cards up here, and it will direct you right there. And the last few topics I'd like to talk about are fluoridation and amalgam. So firstly, fluoridation. Now, fluoride is a really big player when it comes to the dental scene. This is because it's a very important remineralizing agent, which is usually found in toothpaste, which is why you're probably told by a dentist you should use fluoride toothpaste specifically, even though some people don't use fluoride toothpaste, which you know kind of baffles me, but each to their own. This means that it can actively help remineralize the tooth structure in your mouth, which is particularly useful when it comes to things such as caries, and which is why a lot of dentists recommend it as a preventative measure for those that are suffering from caries. Additionally, it's important to know that a lot of toothpastes have about 1350 to 1500 parts per million fluoride in them. But apart from fluoridation in toothpaste, fluoride has actually been introduced in some water systems in the UK. This is mostly found up north, whereby 15% of the UK population actually has access to fluoridated water. And this is a very hot topic because a lot of people have differing opinions when it comes to the fluoridation of water and how effective it is. Some people say that it's very good because it means that people can have better oral health as it helps remineralize their teeth, whilst others may say this is forcibly medicating the population and is actually more harm than good. Furthermore, too much fluoridation can actually lead to something called fluorosis. This can cause discoloration teeth and is something highly undesirable. It's up to you to evaluate this in your answers. And the very last topic I thought I'd go into is amalgam. Now, amalgam is a filling material, and the reason why it's so famous is because it's an alloy and it contains the metal mercury. Now, a lot of you probably know that mercury is considered toxic, so sure it doesn't make sense for us to put mercury in our mouths when it comes to placing a filling. As a result of this, in the past there was an investigation into the safety of amalgam fillings in the mouth, and it was actually deemed that amalgam can be considered unsafe as a result of the toxic vapors that may be released by the mercury. And thus this led to something called the Mini Mata Convention in 2013, where it was noted that amalgam should actually be phased out as a filling material in dental practice. As a result of this, the UK is on track to stop using amalgam fillings by the year 2030 and instead utilize other filling materials such as resin composite. Now you may be thinking what good thing can come out of amalgam, why was it even used in the first place? So the reason why amalgam was used in the first place and why it's still used in some NHS practices is because it's quite cost effective, number one. Number two, it's a very strong material and has great load bearing capabilities. And lastly, it's not very technique sensitive. If you saw how you use amalgam, you kind of just pack it into the filling. It can be quite easy for dentists to use. I hope you guys found that video useful. I think the main takeaways are to make sure you know the content, but also ensure you know how to evaluate each hot topic. This shows the interview that you have the right analytical skills for a degree such as dentistry. And lastly, if you enjoyed the video, please make sure that you do like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification down below. And again, I'll just say it really does help the channel out if you subscribe and hit the notification bell because it shows YouTube that you like my content and helps recommend to the right people out there. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I wish you a happy 2021. The bar hasn't been set too high.